All right, we'll get started. Thank you for coming uh, to the last session of the Intro to Linux course. Um, the main thing we're going to cover tonight is kind of just, it, it's less necessarily Linux specific and more just the suite of software that exists around Linux. Because uh, this is stuff that if you are really going to start using Linux a lot or if you find yourself using Linux a lot, it's helpful to kind of know what other programs exist in that ecosystem uh, and how what programs are the standard programs for doing certain things in that kind of an ecosystem. We're also going to talk a little bit about uh, installing Linux and about running both Linux programs on Windows and running Windows programs on Linux. There's systems that exist to aid you in doing that in both directions. And then we'll kind of just open it up for general questions uh, and maybe touch a little bit on some trends kind of in the Linux world that are things you might encounter if you're going to be dealing with this for a significant period of time. Before I start, are there any questions people want to ask right off the bat from previous sessions, things that they want to make sure I touch on tonight? Okay. Well, I'll start running through things then. So, Linux, like we've said before, is a free and open source uh, operating system where free is with a capital F, meaning not only do you not have to pay any money for it, but you have the ability to take the source code, modify it, make your own version of Linux, uh, make Andy X or whatever you want to call it, right? Because um, that's what people do. They create an operating system and they enact themselves like Linus Trivolts did with Unix. That's why we have Linux in the first place. So there's a whole bunch of software that kind of also exists in this paradigm and is free and open source software, meaning, again, it's free with both a capital and lowercase f, so you don't have to pay any money for it, and the source code's available. You can do whatever you want with it. There are no restrictions on your use of the software. Uh, and because Linux is kind of in this free and open source community, a lot of this software is also used with Linux. Not all of this is Linux-specific software. Some of this software is multi-platform. It will run on Windows and stuff, too. Um, but these are kind of the general set of software that you will tend to use when you're working in the Linux environment. Um, a lot of these we're going to be looking at are GUI software, so it's not going to just be on the command line like we have been in previous weeks. Some of this stuff is just on the command line, some of it's both. That higher, there's a command line interface if you want to script it, but then there's also a GUI if you just want to use it off the bat. Um, so we'll start, and no, I guess I have a set of apps that aren't in necessarily any specific order, but um, We'll start by talking about some of the multimedia apps that exist in Linux, because Linux does have a pretty strong community around multimedia, be it audio, video, uh, the whole swath there. So if multimedia is anything you deal in, then these are things you're probably going to be touching. Uh, FFmpeg is a command line application that page for, is essentially your Swiss army knife of audio and video conversion and anything else you can imagine. It says video converter, but it does audio too. If you can imagine two formats that exist in the universe, FFmpeg can probably convert between them. Uh, it can also do basic things like applying some basic video filters, uh, changing the length of certain things, stripping stuff on and off. It's pretty standard on most Linux installs, so you'll often find you don't really have to install it. Uh, and a lot of GUI tools are actually just wrappers around FFmpeg. They're calling FFmpeg in the background. Um, but this is your de facto, if you have a multimedia file, be it audio or video in one format, and you need to convert it to another format, FFmpeg will let you do that. And I mean, it, it, generally it's smart enough to know what you want within reason. Uh, if you give it an input file with some file extension, you give it an output file with some file extension, it will generally, based upon the file extensions, try to figure out what formats you want. You can also specify the formats directly and all of the options that they represent. Um, it can get kind of complicated, but in reality, what you do is use Google for FFmpeg convert MP3 to Apple, whatever, uh, and you'll get a nice little spit out of exactly what commands to run. If you want to know all the nitty gritty details of everything it can do, that's what the man page exists for. So we're kind of just going to go from one program to the next. I'm not going to stop to demo all of these because it would take all night. But FFmpeg, it exists. It's great for converting multimedia files. Jump in with questions if you guys have them. So other yeah. prominent. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, are we going to make a list of the programs, like the commands? So yeah, I can send it out. I have a list in front of me already, so I'll just stick it on, or I'll either link to it or stick it on the email later. Um, I actually have an updated copy of the entire syllabus that actually has what we talked about, so maybe I'll just send a link to that in the list of programs. So uh, the next program we'll look at is 
kind of drawing and photo manipulation in Linux. These, the, so it's actually two programs that you tend to use a lot. Uh, the first one's called Inkscape, and Inkscape's a vector editor. So it is your equivalent for like an Adobe Illustrator, if you guys are familiar. Uh, so vector editors mean that you're not actually manipulating at the pixel level. You're manipulating, everything's parametric. So you're like, I have a line and it's up this length. I have a box and it's up this length. Um, vector editors are nice, or vector images are nice when you have an image that you want to be able to scale infinitely. Because there are never any pixels, you can make it as big as you want, and the system knows how to draw it. Because it's not like you're trying to, you're not going to get pixelated, because you're saying, I have a box and it's of this size. So when you make it bigger, the computer just scales up the box and it scales up everything else. So Inkscape won't be installed by default, but Inkscape <coughs> is the, uh, it's actually a great free and open source vector editor. I use it on Windows too, because Adobe Illustrator costs $500 and this is free and it does everything Adobe Illustrator does uh, at least. It's also scriptable, which Adobe Illustrator isn't. If you actually have a photographic memory and noticed in that LaTeX make file I showed you last week, we actually call into the command line version of Inkscape to convert various vector images to, um, to PDFs and stuff like that for us. So this is Inkscape. It's, I mean, it has all the options you'd expect. None of them are you can set up a grid, you can set up snapping, you can draw shapes of various types, uh, you can draw lines, you can connect stuff, you can group stuff. I mean, it's a standard drawing program. So vector editors and drawing programs are often the same thing. Um, it's great if you ever need to make diagrams, if you ever need to make, uh, so diagrams tend to fit nicely into the vector image paradigm. Um, if you ever need to make flow charts, if you need to do basic two-dimensional, you wouldn't really do 3D stuff in here, but if you need to do like basic two-dimensional schematics, it's great for stuff like that. Um, and it's available on OS X and Windows as well, so it's not just a Linux program. Questions on Inkscape? So the other side of the image manipulation suite then is, well, if you don't have a vector image, you have a raster image. So this would be the equivalent of like Adobe Photoshop. Um, where you're editing photographs, you're editing things that actually have per pixel data, uh, and you want to do some kind of manipulation on them. And the standard raster editor is called GIMP. It's also uh, it's also available on a whole suite of platforms. Um, change the start screen. It's available on a whole bunch of platforms. It's again very similar to Adobe Photoshop, um, but way cheaper. Uh, it can do pretty much everything Photoshop can do. It has a slightly different interface. And you can change so the interface so actually, to, so it's more traditional. Right, and, and yeah, it's it's also heavily extensible. So there are other people's interfaces out there. It's running off the bottom of my screen right now, which is a little bit frustrating. So I think what you meant is that you can make a, it, it's, a lot of people complain that it's all these multiple windows, and with the latest version, you can combine them into a parent window somehow by default. So, I mean, it is similar in Photoshop in that, too, and Photoshop has these multiple frames floating around. But this would be, so if you have a photograph and you want to manipulate it uh, kind of at the per pixel level, this is where you can, I mean, so this is like closer to an MS Paint or a Photoshop or something like that. It's not a vector editor. As soon as you do something like that, those pixels are committed. It's not remembering this as some kind of like a parametric line. Um, but it's great if you want to deal with photos, if you need to do image manipulation, if you want to counterfeit money. Yeah, all of those good things that you do in a nice uh, in the Linux here. environment. Yeah, that's true. It's only in Linux can you turn off the laser printer part that automatically hard codes its serial number and everything you print so the government can trace your counterfeit money back to you. Um, questions on GIMP or what GIMP does? Again, this is available on Windows and OS X as well. Uh, if you don't have Photoshop but you want to do kind of very powerful much more so than MS Paint type raster editing. It's your go-to tool. So those are your two big image editors. Uh, also in the multimedia world is the ability to play media. So VLC, is the VLC media player, it actually stands for Video Land Chat, which has little to do with what it does today. Uh, but the VLC media player is you, whereas FFmpeg will convert any format, VLC will play any format. So audio or video, if the format exists under the sun, VLC will play it. Uh, this is also available for Windows and Mac, and it's hugely useful, because when someone sends you some obscure video file that they took on their mm. propriety 1995 cell phone that no one in the world's ever heard of before, 
VLC will play it, uh, and FFmpeg will convert it. But iMovie's not going to play it. Windows Media Player is not going to play it. I mean, none of those speak the number of formats that these programs speak. Um, VLC can also do streaming and all kinds of jazz. You can point out a web address. Uh, it can stream video or audio from that web address. It's not really like an iTunes in the sense it doesn't have a media library so much, although it has a little bit of a playlist concept. But it's more of a one-off player. You would point it at a file. It would open the file and it would play it for you. It would also play DVDs. If you have a DVD on a Linux machine, you want to watch the DVD. VLC tends to be your go-to tool for that. Um, it's very powerful. It's multi-platform, and it really will play pretty much anything that exists. VLC. Cool. Moving right along then. So this is also a program that exists in OS X and Apple as well, but it's called Audacity, and it's an audio editing program. So this would be your, and again, it's pretty standard in the free and open source software world for doing basic audio editing. So if you have an audio clip, you need to cut it, you need to change its length, you need to apply it, you need to reverse it. So you can play the Beatles backwards and listen to them talk about Barry and Paul. I mean, whatever you want to do to an audio file, this is your audio manipulator. Uh, it also has built-in record functionality. I don't know if it's talking to my microphone right now. Yeah. So you can record directly in it. It'll give you your standard waveform, you can cut that up, you can rearrange it, you can invert it, you can apply filters, apply white noise, generate white noise, generate pink noise, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, you can put multiple tracks in here and mix them together. Uh, it's not really a big multi-track like you would have in a recording studio type editor. There's other software for doing that if you want to record your whole band. But if you just need to edit a file, you just need to combine a couple of files, it's a very useful program for stuff like that. So Audacity. Everything I've talked about thus far is actually multi-platform. Um, so these are not just limited to Linux. You can use most of these run on OS X and Windows as well. One of the advantages to being an open source program is if you exist and someone wants to use you on a Mac, they'll take your source code and figure out how to compile it on a Mac, and then all of a sudden there's a Mac program. So many of these open source programs have ports on multiple machines because all it takes is someone in the community to decide they want to do it. Whereas if I decide I want Microsoft Office on Linux, I can't go and ask Microsoft for their source code, so I can build it for Linux. Okay, so I don't think I have this installed. Let's go to the website. Yeah. Uh, so if any of you guys do animation, Blender is actually kind of one of the de facto, uh, one of the de facto 3D animation programs even outside of free software, uh, even amongst the paid world, this is kind of one of the de facto programs. Um, it does 3D animation. You can make Toy Story in it and other things like that. Uh, so I don't actually know how to use it because I'm not a 3D animator, but there are good tutorials out there. If animation is something you're interested in, especially at the 3D variety, Blender is the tool for you. Uh, it also will do basic video editing, um, although it's mainly an animation tool. A uh, 3D animation tool more so than it is just a blanket video editor. Um, it's cool. There have been movies made in it. You can watch it on their website. Other than Blender, I don't think I have this one installed either, but uh, there is also a program called Pencil. Pencil is the 2D equivalent of Blender. So this is a 2D animation program. Pencil is actually really cool and much easier to learn than Blender. So if you have some kind of a presentation where you need some like basic two-dimensional animations for it that goes beyond what PowerPoint will give you, or you just don't get PowerPoint, uh, then Pencil is kind of the tool for you. Uh, also multi-platform, also fully open source. Uh, it's actually a little bit. It's been out for a while now, and I don't think it's been updated in a few years. But it's still plenty capable. Um, it's a really sleek 2D animation tool for doing all kinds of fun, making your robot walk across the screen or whatever kind of 2D animation you want to do. And the last thing we'll look at, do you have XBMC running on your laptop right now? Yeah. What's your, what's your um, home media? Oh, yeah, XBMC. Yeah, okay. So maybe I'll have Matt show this when he stands up here in a few minutes, because he actually has it running. Um, but there is a program called XBMC, which is essentially, it's more of a system-wide thing than these other programs, but it basically turns your Linux box into something kind of TiVo-like. Uh, it gives you, it's well, just. Well, so XBMC is like a, a set-top box program. I use it on my desktop, which has a TV connected to it, because we don't have cable. 
Uh, so it's great at organizing movies and downloading uh, um, movie posters and getting ratings and stuff like that and making it look real clean. Um, Myth TV is the TiVo okay. application. But so this is if you have a Linux box connected to your TV, this will give you a nice big interface that you can handle with remote control. It gives you access to your music, access to your videos, so you can play them. Can you stream from YouTube and stuff like that? Yeah, there's a YouTube app. There's plugins. Yeah. You can get plugins from the interface. So like your modern DVD player is not a DVD player. It's really a multimedia box. This will give you that kind of functionality uh, on Linux. It's less common to see this installed on your laptop and more common to see it installed on some cheap Linux machine that you've stuck next to your TV. Um, but this, and then so the other one Matt mentioned was Myth TV, uh, which is more the TiVo approach. So this is, you install this on a system, it's also Linux based. Um, you have to have a tuner card for you, so you can buy TV tuners that you stick into your computer that you can then plug your cable or your antenna into, and this will do what TiVo does. It'll record shows for you, it'll allow you to play them back later, so on and so forth. So if you want to build your kind of own home media CD, Myth TV, XBMC uh, are kind of the two platforms, depending on which route you want to go, that lets you do that. Yeah, I think you can actually use XBMC as a front end for Myth TV. Myth TV is this whole distributed thing where you can have some box in your in your basement that has a tuner card that can record shows and has everything stored on it, and then you can have front end computers around the house and little thin, uh, in little thin enclosures that just serve the content. And you can use XBMC for that also because I think that it's got a cleaner look and feel to it. So there is a huge community of people out there that build Linux powered media computers essentially, so there are very good tutorials for how to set up systems with all of these if you basically want to build your own TiVo from scratch or build your own Netflix app from scratch. Netflix buys a good example because Netflix is notoriously hard to make work on Linux because of some of the content protection stuff they do. Um, but that's the exception, not the rule. This will do most everything those uh, other kind of multimedia type applications will do. Um, cool. Questions on any kind of the multimedia stuff? So the next set of apps we'll look at is kind of your general suite of office or productivity apps. So the one that you'll find pre-installed on pretty much every, um, every Linux distro anymore is called LibreOffice. This is the updated version that came out of the OpenOffice project. Some of you may know that name better. Um, but it's called LibreOffice now, at least the part that's in active development. This is a Microsoft Office replacement. Um, so it can open Microsoft Office files, it can read Microsoft Office files. If they're using a bunch of Microsoft Office specific formatting, sometimes it doesn't do as good of a job, but if it's a pretty basic Word file, this will open it. If it's a basic PowerPoint, this will open it. This will also allow you to generate it, edit it. It has all your, so it has a Word equivalent, has an Excel equivalent, has a PowerPoint equivalent. Um, so this is the Word equivalent, this is just the top level. And it has a basic little drawing program too. This is way less powerful than Inkscape, so most people just use Inkscape, but if you just need to like sketch up something simple to then paste into your PowerPoint slide, uh, that'll do it as well. So, I mean, it, it looks a lot like MS Office looks. It has a, obviously, you gotta learn where things are in a little bit different way. I actually never really use any of these because if I need to do something complicated with lots of formatting, I use LaTeX, and if I need to do something simple, I use Google Docs, so these kind of get squeezed out in the middle. Um, but for people that don't want to use LaTeX for everything and still want kind of a traditional Office app, that's what these are, uh, MS Word equivalents, so on and so forth. Um, very well supported, lots of stuff out there. They support all the Word formats, and the new versions of Word support their native formats as well. So it's actually getting surprisingly easy to kind of use documents in a world where some people are using this and some people are using Word, so on and so forth. So we've mentioned LaTeX a couple of times. Um, it is basically, I wonder if I have anything good on here. Uh, so it's basically just a, um, it's a typesetter is what we call it. It's a uh, command page. But if you have, most of your textbooks are probably written in LaTeX. It does a really good job of laying out tables, laying out figures, typesetting graphics in ridiculously beautiful manners. It's actually a set of macro wrappers around an older program just called Tech, just the TEX part. Um, 
And that was originally written by a famous computer scientist who wrote the art of computer programming and needed a typesetting program to typeset all of these books, so he created tech. And then they created Law Tech, which is basically an easier to use version of tech. Um, so it's great, it's super powerful, it does have a learning curve, but it's not insurmountable. It's a markup language, so like HTML, you're not just typing your documents anymore, you're typing your documents and then telling it, this is the introduction section, this is the figure, and here's the file you're getting it from, and then you basically compile it and you get to spit out a nice PDF that is beautiful and is typeset better than anything else out there. So if you're typesetting our font snob, LaTeX is also the way to go because it does everything you could want to do that MS Word can't. Um, is there like a default PDF kind of printer that you use in all these different programs like your word processor if you want to make So uh, it's going to be distro specific, but yes, uh, Ubuntu just has one built in. Okay. Um, so if I go to print in any program in Ubuntu, it offers print PDF. I mean, that's pretty standard. Okay. So there's different backends that those use, and that's going to be distro specific, but the ability to print directly to PDF is pretty standard in most desktop Linux environments. Okay, I'll, I'll go into it a little bit more. Yeah. That's okay, I just wanted to know if we had to add it basically. There's okay. also a, yeah, I mean, there's also a whole set of conversion commands on the command line. So, this is a little program that takes in PostScript files, which is another format most of you probably never use, but PostScript is actually one of the formats that LaTeX originally generated. Now you just always go straight to PDF, but there are other equivalents to this too, that just on the command line can quickly take the document and spit it out of PDF. Um, and a lot of this are part of a, you know what the name of the? GoScript. Is it all GoScript behind the scenes? So GoScript is this collection of libraries that's doing a lot of this behind the scenes. So it does a good job. Um, there's a common print dialog that's used for most applications, um, and that has a built-in thing to generate a PDF. Uh, LibreOffice and a few other applications have their own print dialogs, which suck, and they, they don't give you that print to PDF. So there's a, a pretty easy to set up PDF printer that you can install. An yeah, virtual printer? Yeah. Um, and they also have export. Usually those programs have their own export features to PDF. And usually, I recommend export to PDF and then use the PDF viewer, viewer to act to physically print because I find that those custom dialogues are horrible. But the general one is really nice, especially if you want two sided printing. And stuff like that. So, this is the general one, like I yeah. said, that print to files built in, and that will, by default, allow you to print to PDF. It can also do PostScript and SVG, but in real life, PDF is what you almost always use. So yeah, it's pretty much a built-in feature across the board in Linux. Windows isn't there yet. Um, so LaTeX great. It's a typesetting program. It really, if you're writing anything over five to ten pages that has a whole bunch of figures and stuff, it's way better than MS Office because it does automatic numbering and everything for you. You never hard code a number anywhere in LaTeX. So if you have numbered figures and then you add a figure, it'll automatically renumber them. You just refer to them by references, and then it automatically changes all of your numbers within. If you say figure one ten times, and all of a sudden figure one becomes figure three, it automatically updates all of those. It does all of your references for you. It'll do your formatting for you. It has options. You can make it do two column to make it look like a journal article. Most academic journal articles are required to be submitted in LaTeX because that's what they're using to typeset their journals. So it is the de facto, at least in the technical world, typesetting tool. Um, mainly because it does math formatting very nicely, which is how it kind of got the end originally. But you can use it for anything. It doesn't have to just be because it does nice formulas. So kind of for like a spell checking and that type of thing, you would type it first in another application and then copy and paste it into LaTeX? Or what do you do? Vendors have spell check plugins. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so lot, yeah, LaTeX, think of it kind of like a compiler. Uh -huh. um, you don't type anything in LaTeX itself. So, uh -huh. um, I mean, this is so not a... This, is, this example has nothing in it right now, so it's really simple. But essentially, I just have, these are just, so this is my LaTeX file. So this is my LaTeX file. It's just a text file, so I would just open it in Emacs. Ah, oh, I see. I would go through and edit it in Emacs, mm -hmm. uh, and then I just basically, call, so I call the make file on it, because it's another magic, but there's essentially a LaTeX command that you just pass this to. Emacs has a built-in spell checker, mm -hmm. uh, so if I go to a word, spell word, so if I go to a word, I have it shortcutted on mine, but I can basically ask it to spell check this word, and it'll give me options up here. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it's not really built in, but Emacs has spell check support. It's actually calling a program called aspell, which is the standard Linux spell checker on the back end. Is it um, on Vim? Does Vim also have a spell checker? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's probably also calling aspell or ispell. Okay. Um, there's two versions of the standard Linux spell checker. It's aspell and ispell. They both essentially do the same thing. Aspell is a little better maintained. Uh, but you can also do like a wooden word and tell it to spell check the whole document and just take you through one at a time. So spell checking is a property of the editor, not a property of LaTeX. <coughs> Actually, it's a property of the spell checker, but Emacs has an interface for the spell checker. You can actually use the spell checker directly from the command line. Yeah. So I could like pipe a file into a spell, and then it'll take me through each of the misspellings it finds in it one at a time and offer to correct them for me and stuff like that. So, but in reality, you almost always just your, your editor has a plugin for one of these spell checkers that you use spell checking that. Which is great, because then I don't make any spelling mistakes in the comments in my code either. Like, this is a problem with the editor. If I'm writing code and I want to make sure I spell my variable name correct, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can actually spell check code. Not that that's something you would normally do. So if you want to install the LaTeX on your laptop, you're going to use a, a sudo apt get mm -hmm. install? So, uh, there's actually a, the command's not just, so Watek is the language, more or less, and there yes. are actually multiple implementations of basically the logic thing that actually turns it into a PDF. Mm -hmm. uh, the common one on, in most distros is called TechLive. Um, so you would do a sudo apt get install TechLive, and then, so you could hit tab. Oh, come on, they're not funny. I found LaTeX to be one of the most difficult things to actually install. So it's not. I, it's not hard on you. I install everything and probably have like two gigs of extra stuff because there's all sorts of little external libraries yeah. to do draw different types of things, and I don't know where they come from. So you can hit tab in the sudo apt get install context. So I did sudo apt get install tech live tab, and it gave me all the completions. Um, so the one that you want for LaTeX is down here in the corner right now. So the package is TechLive LaTeX 3, and then that'll pull in a set of dependencies. And there's there's extra stuff here that you often install. The safest way to do it is probably just to do a sudo apt get install TechLive dash LaTeX dash or LaTeX star, and then that'll install all of these LaTeX packages. Um, what these get you is LaTeX has various plugins. So like if you want to automatically have URLs in your PDF like actually be links and stuff, there's a plugin that handles that. Um, if you want to automatically lay it out in a different, I mean, there's a whole bunch of plugins, and that's what these are installing. It's basically that big library of LaTeX plugins that you can then use. Um, then what's the difference between the sudo apt, apt get install, and the Ubuntu software center? There isn't. The Ubuntu software center is a GUI wrapper around this. So if you install from the Ubuntu software center, it's actually calling apt get behind the scenes. Okay. Uh, I always just use apt get because I prefer this interface, but as you point out, you can, the other thing is too, not everything is in the software center. There is more things available directly via apt get. The software center is kind of like the hand-picked stuff that gets used frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is a GUI around the installer. If you don't like using apt get from the command line, I don't even think I have the GUI app up here. Um, So there's this thing called the Ubuntu Software Center that's basically a searchable browser. So you can search for LaTeX or something and then it'll bring up the installer, but it's gonna install those packages behind the scene. You only ever have one package manager on the system uh, and this is just a GUI wrapper around it. The one thing this is useful for is browsing. Uh, so like if I wanna go look at what all of the games that are available are, there's no good way for me to do that with apt-get. I can search apt-get for specific names, but I can't just say give me all the games. Uh, so this is nice if you want to browse, but if you kind of know what you want, or at least you know part of what you want, apt gets the way to, it tends to be a little faster. But you can use this too, it's the same thing, this just lets you click. Uh, so questions on LaTeX, on the software center, anything like that? Like they pointed out, I mean you could teach an entire class on LaTeX, but there are also real good tutorials online. Um, and if you, for the, the simple stuff you normally, the day to day things you do in LaTeX, you can learn pretty quickly. It just happens to be, there's all kinds of obscure things you can do too, and that's what most of the documentation is talking about. Um, but it's good to know how to use, if you're ever writing a big thesis or in a grad school in a technical program, there are going to be people that assume you know LaTeX. So it's something to learn at some point. 
if you're going to graduate with your bachelor's and go work for a defense contractor, you may never have to know law tech in your life. But maybe one day everyone will wake up and realize law tech's the greatest thing since sliced bread. One can hope, right? I love it. It's wonderful. Uh, but I'm also a tech setting nerd, so there's that side of it. Other kind of office apps. Uh, so there's a program called Scribus. Maybe I have this installed. So uh, Scribus also, I never really use it, again, because I use LaTeX, but this is a GUI layout tool. So if you were making a magazine, this is the kind of tool you would use to do it. It lets you do like much better defined layout than you can do in Word and say, I need an image here. I need text to wrap around it in this manner. Uh, it's very similar to like an Adobe, um, it's Adobe's layout tool, does anyone know? Illustrator. Uh, uh, not Illustrator. PageMaker. Not PageMaker. What did you say? InDesign. Yeah, InDesign. Thanks. It's very familiar. It's very similar to like an Adobe InDesign. Uh, so if you've ever been in the publishing business, uh, InDesign is something you would have touched. Scribus is not as powerful as InDesign, but is the closest thing kind of in the open source word world to InDesign. Um, there is a program called Thunderbird. I don't use it, but this is kind of the de facto mail program on on most, uh, I mean, especially if you want a powerful mail program on a Linux system. So this is your Microsoft Outlook, Outlook replacement. This will do calendaring, it'll do mail, it'll do contact management, it does everything. Uh, it's maintained by Mozilla, the same people that make Firefox, uh, but it's a separate project. So if you like something like Outlook and you want the equivalent to that in a Linux box, or again, this is multi-platform, you can run this on anything. If you don't want to pay for Outlook, if you want all the Outlook functionality, Thunderbird is the way to go. Um, the last one I've never used, but some people swear by it. There's a program called GNU Cache. This is basically accounting software, like you would expect. It's maintained by the GNU Foundation, which makes a lot of the software we've been looking at. Uh, it's like a Microsoft Money or something like that. If, if you don't like making your own spreadsheets to do all your finances, then this gives you nice built-in kind of financial management stuff. It's also designed for small businesses, so it's certainly not as powerful as like some major, totally unusable Dell Tech branded financial software out there, but uh, it's a nice alternative if you just need to keep the books for something of a reasonably sized small company or something. So that's kind of most of the office software that I'm familiar with being in prominent usage. Missing nothing obvious. So there's a does, suite. The, um, does anybody have something that they use on Windows that if they were going to use Linux? That, yeah. OneNote? OneNote? Yeah. What is OneNote? It's like a scribbling. Yeah. So, um, I, I know. Is it TomNote? I don't know There's Tomboy, Tomboy. that's Tomboy. Text for tablets to take notes on. Right. Uh, like on a PDF. Oh, oh OneNote. I think there is like a. There's always use these screw stuff, Tomboy. Um, <laughs> Tomboy is just anything that's like text, though. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I think there is. I'll so, okay. there's a good way to answer all these questions, and that's to do Linux equivalent OneNote. And you'll get tons of forum posts with people asking that question, and everyone who has half a brain responding with their opinion of what the right answer is. Um, so, you know, it takes some reading and some troll ignoring, but there's probably a good answer out there. It's actually one of the programs that there goes into good Linux equivalent for. Yeah. So people use Evernote, and there is uh, something called Mixnote that is similar as a front end to OneNote, but I don't think it's in the repository. But, yeah. But it's one of the few programs that there really isn't a good Linux equivalent. So there's actually another trend maybe we'll touch on here at the end that's helping us some in this aspect, but that's even if there isn't a good open source thing available, so much stuff is moving to the cloud, and if it's on the cloud and browser-based, then it doesn't matter what your operating system is anymore. So maybe there's not a good one right now, but like Evernote's a cloud-based app. Um, so there are, as some of this stuff gets pushed into the cloud and run in a browser, then it really doesn't matter what operating system you have anymore. It just doesn't matter what browser you have. Uh, so there's not a perfect equivalent for everything, but a lot of the good stuff's out there. Major engineering tools that you tend to touch a lot in Linux. Um, so the big one is probably R, which some of you guys have maybe used. R is a statistic language. It's a little bit MATLAB-like, but kind of focused on statistics. So I can run it, and it'll open the R interpreter. Uh, so 
it, there's GUIs for it too. It just happens the core part runs on the command line. Um, I would have to look up some R, but the syntax is somewhat MATLAB-like, and then R's real strength is in doing a lot of statistical programming. So if you have giant data sets that you need to load into here and do some fancy statistics on, R is kind of the de facto way to do it. R is used everywhere. Uh, well, at least it's it's quickly replacing a lot of the formal, the propriety statistics packages. I think like, it's um, supposed to be syntactic. No, oh, that's active. I'm, I'm, no, not now, uh, uh, SAS. Oh, with SAS, okay. It's so SAS and things like SAS are quickly going out of style, and R is fat. I mean, this is not just a Linux thing. R is quickly replacing stuff like SAS across the board, especially since R fits in really nicely with some of the new way of doing big data processing. So if you're doing like MapReduce or Hadoop or some of these, if you need to process 10,000 gigabytes every second, you can't use SAS and stuff anymore. You have to use some of these newer technologies, and R tends to mesh real nicely with a lot of them. So you can use R for your post-processing after you use something else for your kind of real-time processing. Um, but R is great if you need to do some fancy statistics. It's worth knowing. Uh, unlike Microsoft Excel, it won't give you wrong answers, and you can rely on it for like light-sensitive -like design and stuff like that. So it's good to know. The other big one that's kind of in the same vein is called GNU Octave. Octave is the open source MATLAB. MATLAB. Uh, so uh, so this is more or less syntactically equivalent to MATLAB. So unless you're using a bunch of weird MATLAB packages that this doesn't have equivalents for, you can take a MATLAB script and run it in Octave, uh, and it'll run. So if you know MATLAB, you know Octave. Uh, I mean, the syntax is pretty much the same, um, right? You can you generate lists, you can do things to it so on and so forth. It, it also has a whole, like MATLAB, it has a whole suite of toolboxes that are like specialized processing plugins for it. Um, it's very good, it's a lot cheaper than MATLAB. Uh, it also is provably accurate, so you can use it for like critical design and, and all the stuff that is the reason we use MATLAB instead of Excel for doing real processing. Um, but Octave also has a lot of GUIs around it, so if you don't like just working on the command line, you can get a nice GUI that's a little more MATLAB-like and has a file browser on one side and a toolbox browser on the other and all of that. I just don't have any of the GUIs installed because I always just use the stuff directly from the command line. So if you need to do MATLAB-like stuff, Octave is your tool. But in the interest of full disclosure, MATLAB runs fine on Linux. They, you know, they, they, it installs fine and runs fine. They support Linux. Right. So you can actually get MATLAB for If you have a MATLAB license, you can, get, you can install it on Linux. Uh, you don't use the package manager because it's proprietary and all that jazz, but there are ways. MATLAB does support Linux, that's correct. And the main reason MATLAB supports Linux is because most supercomputers run Linux. If you want to use MATLAB on a supercomputer, they have to support Linux. Uh, so you may, at times, if you're logging into a big, if you have, I don't know if you need to do, but if you guys have time on a supercomputer or a big processing cluster that has MATLAB installed, it runs fine in Linux. You just have to deal with the command line, too. Um, so that also exists. But Octave, does almost everything MATLAB does for $2,000 cheaper, and you can look at the source code, which really, I don't know, people don't get concerned about this, but they probably should. Uh, you maybe don't want your airplane calculations being computed by a piece of software that you have no ability to see whether or not they're doing it right. At least in Octave, someone can go and peer review the source code and make sure they don't have a serious bug. If MATLAB is a serious bug, no one's gonna know until an airplane crashes, and they go and figure it out after the fact. So. There are provability and kind of traceability benefits to open source software that aren't necessarily have as much weight behind them as maybe they should. But you know, what's what's the Simulink equivalent? It's like Skyzo Lab or something. Like that. So I didn't use a ton. I've never used a ton of Simulink in MATLAB or the equivalent in Octave. I would have. I don't know off the top of my head. I would have to look. Um, there are, I mean, if you're into kind of that whole graphical data flow programming, there are tools like that for Linux. Also, things like LabVIEW will run on Linux. You can get LabVIEW for Linux and stuff like that as well. Uh, I don't know if there is a real, like, LabVIEW or Simulink. I'd have to look. Um, I don't know of an equivalent for either of those off the top of my head, although there are other graphical programming languages in Linux that are well supported. Um, maybe I should hold this to the end, but I was wondering, 
Are the system requirements for Linux a lot different than Windows? And are there certain things you should look for if you're buying a laptop or a desktop? Uh, we can answer it now. Maybe we can touch on it at the end. No. Um, okay. In general, so with a specific program, so if you want to run MATLAB Windows. under Linux or you want to run MATLAB under Windows, it's going to be the same system requirements for the most part. If anything, it'll be a little faster under Linux because Linux tends to take up less space for the operating system than Windows does. Um, if you're buying a desktop that you want to run Linux, you can pretty much buy. So the issue with Linux is if you buy brand spanking new hardware, it sometimes takes a few months for the open source drivers and stuff to kind of make it into the Linux kernel right. and start to be distributed. Uh, so the general rule of thumb is you're going to have a little bit of an early adopter headache. If your hardware came out yesterday and you want to run it in your laptop running Linux tomorrow, there tend to be a little bit of some early adopter headaches. If you're willing to wait four weeks or a month or two after the hardware's been readily available, then it tends to be in the mainline kernel and you're good to go. Um, it just takes a little while to filter. First has to get into the kernel, then your distro has to update to the newest kernel, so it has to filter down a few steps. If you're like Matt and you just run basically the latest and greatest kernel, so Ubuntu doesn't let you do this. Uh, Ubuntu, you have to use a kernel that they've like approved and it's a couple notches behind the latest and greatest, but the way Matt does it, he can basically run the latest and greatest kernel, which gets you those changes faster. What, what distribution like do you run Matt? Arch Linux. And I compile my own kernel, but you can. Do you have, do you run X Windows? Or do you yes. just use command line? Okay, so the X Windows. It's um, a different window manager, but. Uh, the yeah. one kind of pain point tends to be, especially with laptops, can be video cards. Uh, NVIDIA, right now at least, tends to be better supported than AMD stuff. Um, although Linus Trevolds is not an NVIDIA fan. Okay, so. Hmm. And Matt Matt can insert this. Yeah, so wait, if you're buying a laptop with the intent of putting Linux on it, one, it would be great if you could find one where they don't make you buy a Windows license. That's kind of yeah, no brainer. Uh, Intel has probably, if you don't game and you just need a good graphics card for playing video and stuff, Intel has a good driver. Their driver is only an open source driver and it works well and they support their cards. Uh, and then for both NVIDIA and ATI, they have a closed source driver and an open source driver. ATI, the open source driver, is better supported than the NVIDIA open source driver. And the reason why you would want to use the open source driver is if you have, say, a laptop and you need to um, switch resolutions a lot because you're plugging in monitors, those types of things tend to work better with the open source drivers. ATI's closed source driver uh, kind of is a pain in the, in the butt, and I don't think it works very well. So if you don't really care about that and you just need like a gaming Linux computer, you probably want an NVIDIA card because their driver, their closed source binary driver works pretty well. Just not for certain things that interact with the rest of the computer, like changing resolutions and stuff like that. You are lucky though, this wasn't true five years ago, but we're quickly getting to the point where pretty much any hardware works out of the box with Linux. Um, we're almost there. If you have something brand new and it's a video card from AMD, you might not be able to get it to work right away. Is there anything like battery-like management and stuff? Like, there's a yeah, so, of tools for that. Yeah, um, the biggest thing I've noticed is there's a scaling governor for the CPU. Um, there's a few of them. The, the one you should probably be using is called On Demand. And basically what that says is if your CPU is at a certain percent load, bump it up to the next uh, um, clock. Right, so like normally my, my laptop runs at like 800 megahertz, and if it starts to get get uh, loaded, it goes up to like 1.2 gigahertz, and then up to like three, you know, however high. So, and that's pretty much the biggest thing for power management. What is it called? Uh, on demand. Yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it's a it's a kernel module. You don't generally have to deal with this stuff yourself. If you're using like a standard desktop, like oh, Ubuntu yeah. or something, it'll this stuff will be built in. There have been a few little issues in the past. Again, it's a driver thing. So if you have a brand new Intel processor and they've added some new power management stuff, it's not going to get into the kernel drivers for a little while. So it may be the next Ubuntu release before Ubuntu can take advantage of that power management on that newest chip. But it all gets there eventually, and it's getting faster. Uh, it, it's getting a lot faster. Yeah, I get I get really good battery life on my laptop. Like how long? Uh, four hours I'm using it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even at a netbook that gets seven hours running Linux, so there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. Uh, Intel has a tool called PowerTop, which lets you 
see what processes and what, what pieces of hardware are using the most power. And you can debug things like, oh, I left Wacom LAN on on my wireless card. So when I suspend, the wireless card is staying powered up, but it really doesn't need to be. So you can use that to turn that off to turn features off. Yeah, I mean, you can tweak to your heart's content. There's plenty of tools out there for that. But in general, Linux will run on pretty much anything, uh, more so than Windows will, even. Um, the only issue is with brand new hardware, you sometimes have to wait for someone to write the open source Linux code to handle. Uh, so on the CAD front, there's actually a whole suite of pretty decent CAD programs for Linux. Uh, LibraCAD probably is one of the nicer GUIs, but this is your AutoCAD equivalent. You need to do 2D technical drawing or something like that. There's this tool, there's a whole bunch of others too. Um, but you can make that happen on here. There's also some 3D parametric tools. So if you're looking for like a SolidWorks equivalent or something, there's those out there too. I don't do a whole lot of parametric modeling anymore, so I don't have my favorite off the top of my head, but they do exist. Um, and they are out there. And the 3D printing community is actually really driving that because a lot of them are big open source users too. So they need parametric modelers, they're big open source users. The code is quickly becoming very mature. Okay, questions on kind of engineering type tools in Linux. That's what I have. Uh, so the last set's kind of just a random assortment of other tools that you see a ton in Linux. What are the main things Linux is used for in the world? I mean, it's used for a lot of things, but most web servers run Linux. Uh, and the way they do that is with a program called Apache, uh, which Apache is the actual web server. Oh, I don't have installed on here. So that's going to fail. Uh, if you remote into my server, you can read the man page on Apache that we were in the other day. It has Apache installed on it. But Apache is the most deployed web server in the world, um, far more so than like Windows IIS. Uh, there's some new up and coming little ones like uh, Nijing. Yeah, Nijing. I don't know how to pronounce it. Light HTTP. Yeah, you always see it written in G and IX. Um, but there's some, there's some other ones, but they all, Apache's the big one. If you it is basically, it, it is the web server on your computer and it does everything you could ever want to do. Uh, it runs things, I'm not a good example anymore. It doesn't run Twitter, because they use internet. But um, it runs, a lot of big websites out there are gonna be run by Apache behind the scenes. Um, so if you wanna run a website, Apache is the tool, or is the server that you learn. Apache has an little ecosystem that goes with it, kind of called the LAMP ecosystem, which stands for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and then Take your pick on the P, it's either PHP or Python or Perl. Um, but all of these tools are, if you talk here, someone talk about like a LAMP web server, that's what they're referring to. It's running Linux, it's using Apache, the database is MySQL, so if you need a big database, this is like your Microsoft Access, but way more powerful, uh, would be MySQL, it's an SQL implementation. Um, SQL is actually going out of style, but you still see it a lot, so you'll touch MySQL is kind of a Linux implementation of an SQL database. Uh, enterprise database server. PHP, of course, all of that jazz if you're into web development is supported on Linux, uh, supported by Apache, Perl, Python, so on and so forth. There is a program called Screen. So we didn't look at this the other day when we were doing SSH, which would have been the logical time to do it. Screen is what's called a terminal multiplexer. What it basically does is it takes your shell or takes your terminal and adds a bunch of extra features in it. Uh, including things like the ability to, so um, I can basically run multiple programs at the same time. So I'm not gonna go through all the hotkeys, but basically when you're in screen, if you do control A and then some other key, you get, um, you can basically open up another window. So that program I just had was still running. I'm just not looking at it anymore. So I can come over here and run another program and then I can switch back to I can switch back to basically my previous window. So if you're in a GUI environment, you can do a lot of this with like having multiple tabs on your terminal. But if you're on a server where you have no GUI, screen kind of gives you that ability. So if you need to have four different programs all running at the same time, screen lets you do that. Fire up one, switch to another, switch back and forth. It, it does everything like, it's like multi-tabbing, but there is no mouse and there is no tabs. It's all just hotkey based. Screen also does a ton of other stuff. It'll let you like save all of this output and search through it later, scroll through it. One of the most useful things that it does is it has what's called, it uses a, a no hangup connection in the backend. So if you SSH into a server and then launch screen on that server, 
and if your internet connection dies and you get booted out, your screen session stays running on the server. And when your internet comes back up, you can reconnect to the server, reload your screen session. If you had like a window open or if you got a program running, it's still running. Um, so it's often a good idea as soon as you SSH into a server to actually launch screen uh, just because if something goes wrong with your SSH connection and get booted out, you don't lose your session that you were working on. Screen maintains in the background. Um, this is also handy if you need to go into a server and run something that's going to run for four hours that you want to come back and look at later. You open up screen, run it from within a screen terminal, then you can exit. You can do, you can do control C or there's different ways of doing it too. But you can basically close out of your connection, shut down your computer, come back four hours later, SSH back in, reconnect, reload your screen session, and it'll, your program will have finished running and you can look at all of its output. Um, screen's super powerful, it does a ton of things. But um, it's worth, if you're doing a lot of SSH uh, or a lot of work on kind of a command line, screen is something worth learning. Uh, it has a nice man page that goes with it. There's good tutorials online. It will definitely save your ass if you're working on a remote server and you get booted out because your internet connection dies and you want to get back in. Um, it's also handy locally just because it, it has some nice features. It's also a serial terminal. So if you need to connect to a serial device or something, you can give screen and you basically just tell it the baud rate you need and the serial device you want it to look at. So it does what like hyper terminal and stuff like that Windows used to do. Uh, so it's again one of those Swiss Army knife things, but um, it's uh, it's very powerful. It's a nice thing to use, especially if you're working on the command line. So look at the man page for all the details and everything it can do. Main things are it lets you multiplex your terminal so you can run multiple things simultaneously uh, without having to use a mouse or anything and it will maintain session state. So if you're remoted in somewhere and you get booted out, you can kind of go back to exactly where you were before you lost your connection. Questions on screen? Okay, so some other remote desktop tools. Um, it's often, I mean, so if you need to remote into another computer, this is something that you can use SSH, but sometimes you need graphics, or sometimes it needs to be a Windows computer that doesn't have SSH built in or something. So to do kind of graphics sharing in Linux, there's a protocol called BNC. Uh, it's actually not great, but it does work. So, um, But more commonly is I need to remote into a Windows server because I'm working on I have some server, someone's using Windows, and I'm maintaining some of their machines for them or something, and I need to do a remote desktop connection to their server. So there's a couple of different options, but the one that's nice on Ubuntu and a lot of other systems is called Remina. It's basically just a, uh, it's a remote desktop manager. It speaks a whole bunch of protocols. So this will do RDP, which is the Windows Remote Desktop. This will do BNC. Uh, it'll actually let you do clever things like SSH tunneling and then doing RDP, or connecting to a VPN and then doing RDP. So I mean, if I just wanted to connect, these are all Windows servers that I have. So I can basically connect into a Windows server running at my house, and now I'm just, I mean, right, this is Windows 8. Um, it sucks, by the way, <laughs> just in case you wanted another reason to switch to Linux. I don't even know how to to get what I want, but um, it lets you remote in. So I work, I consult for a lot of companies that still like Windows Server and stuff, so I use this to remote into their Windows servers and, and change whatever I need, or on the rare occasion I need to run something like Visual Studio or something like that, I'll just remote desktop into one of, one of my Windows machines or a Windows virtual, this is actually a virtual machine, uh, so I'm on a real computer, it's just it's running on one of my, it's running on that same server you guys all remoted into the last week. Um, so it's a great tool to be able to have. This is how, uh, like, so RDP is just one of the protocols it does. It actually will do a whole bunch of other things too. Um, but RDP is the one I use it with the most because that's kind of the, a lot more people on Linux you can tend to just use SSH. It's more if you need to do remote desktop and off mess with Windows. And in that case, it's RDP, which is the Windows protocol. All right, so. Okay, PuTTY. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. This is actually mainly a Windows program, but if you need to, an SSH client on Windows, so this isn't a server, but if you're working on Windows and you need to SSH into a Linux machine, PuTTY is the tool that you want. So you can download and install this. It basically, because by default, if you open up a terminal on Windows and type SSH, there is no SSH on Windows. So this doesn't let you remote into the machine that's running it, but it does let you remote from that machine to someplace else. So if I'm in a Windows environment and I need to connect to one of my Linux servers or something, 
you just download PuTTY, uh, it has its own little terminal and it's, it's just an SSH terminal. So you give it the information on the computer and it does SSH. Um, because it does SSH, it also does a lot of the SSH family. It has a SFTP client, so if I need to go and do file transfer back and forth, so on and so forth. But PuTTY is the best SSH client out there for Windows. So if you need to connect to someone via SSH or any of the SSH related protocols, PuTTY is what you use. And then the last one is transmission. I think I probably have this installed. So transmission is the default BitTorrent client on a lot of Linux machines. It's actually a very, it's also a BitTorrent server. So most people don't really run their own BitTorrent servers, but um, if you need to like do seeding and stuff like that, this is how we actually distribute in CS when we have like a big four gigabyte file we need to distribute. We toss it on BitTorrent, totally legal, but because it's way faster than maintaining a big download server. I mean, if I have 10 gigabytes of data, I don't want you to download that from a server. I'd rather put it into BitTorrent, have it be distributed. Uh, and then transmission, I can use both for kind of pushing things into BitTorrent as well as just doing regular. So if I have a tracker link somewhere and I need to download my totally legal BitTorrent file, um, transmission will be the tool for doing that in Linux. All right. That's kind of the bulk of the main software I was going to talk about. Um, like we mentioned before, more and more there's actually non-free software. I mean, the big software companies are supporting Linux. So you can run MATLAB on Linux, you still have to pay for it. Uh, so Skype has a Linux equivalent. It's not open source, but it's free uh, with a lowercase f. So you can use Skype from Linux. I do it all the time. Uh, things like Eclipse, if you're a big, if you like some of those big IDs, they all have Linux equivalents. Uh, things like um, LabVIEW, like I said before, you can run on Linux. Uh, even Steam. If you're a computer gamer now, just came out with Linux clients and beta right now, so it's not public yet, but soon you'll be able to play Half-Life in Linux. So more and more companies are kind of supporting Linux as just like they support Windows and just like they support OS X. Um, it used to not have such a privileged place in kind of the desktop environment, but that's rapidly changing. So between all the free alternatives with the capital F and between all of the, you can just buy your regular software and they have a Linux version now, it's getting surprisingly easy to use Linux for everything could possibly need to do. Uh, that and the cloudification, because so many of the things we're using now just run in a browser, you have browsers on Linux. I mean, this is Chrome, right? It's just like the Chrome on Windows. If I'm running Facebook, Facebook doesn't care about on Linux or Windows. It's all, all it cares about the that I'm in Chrome. Google Apps is the same way. I can run Google Apps from Linux, uh, so on and so forth. Netflix is the exception. If I go apply, try to play a Netflix movie from a Linux machine, it's going to throw an error at me because Netflix is stupid. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully that'll change soon. It's totally an artificial constraint, and you don't want to get into why Netflix wants to do that. But hopefully, even that barrier will, that's kind of the one cloud barrier I've ever encountered being on a Linux machine. Hulu works fine, so I can watch Hulu on Linux. Questions on kind of Linux programs? Do they have virtual box for the Linux yes. edition? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I, mean, I have it on here. That's how I run my virtual machines. So Which your works. main operating system is Linux, and you do the demo using Windows? Uh, or vice versa. I mean, I, yeah, one of these virtual machines could run Windows. Um, right now, these are all other versions of Ubuntu. But yeah, my computer boots into Ubuntu, and then I can run a virtual. So I can run the same virtual machine you guys are running if I just need, like, a, sometimes it's useful out of static environment. Um, but I could also run, yeah, I could run any virtual machine in here. I could run, I could run Windows inside my Linux operating system, just like most of you are probably running Linux inside your Windows operating system. So you are still using the Linux kernel? Yes, under the scenes, I'm still using Linux. But VirtualBox is multi-platform. So VirtualBox knows how to talk to Linux, and knows how to talk to OS X, and knows how to talk to Windows, all as your host operating system. Mm. And then it'll run whatever you, whatever you please as a virtual machine. Okay. Matter of fact, most of the virtualization tools are actually Linux-based. Um, VMware kind of being the exception, but all of the other, a lot of people do virtualization. So KVM is kind of the big, that Windows machine you saw a minute ago is actually running on a virtualization system called KVM, which is the big Linux virtualization support. So when you're dealing with things like Amazon and stuff, that's all running in virtual machines on top of KVM on top of Linux. Because who wants to pay VMware all that money? Other questions? about general software. Okay, 
So I'll turn it over to Matt now. He's going to go through kind of some of this running Windows thing. So, so every now and then you still have an app that's only for Windows and you need to run on Linux, or you have an app that's only for Linux and you need to run on Windows. Matt will talk about some of the systems that exist for that.